Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. My name is Asad Lalji. Mumbai is a city like none other, a melting pot of diverse cultures, religions, sights, sounds, fragrances, and tastes. Each of us has a unique interaction with Mumbai and its many facets. We at Avid Learning started our successful Multipolis Mumbai series in 2012 to engage with the city and its many avatars, discover histories, new perspectives, trends, of our ever-evolving maximum city. This series has explored the city's rich past as well as look forward to new horizons while tracing the journey of how colonial Bombay has become our much-loved Amchi Mumbai today. We've had over 39 curated programs under this umbrella since 2012 in various formats like workshops, panel discussions, city walks, retrospectives at the Kalagor Arts Festival in 2013, a series of the CSMBS in 2016, and our second iteration of the series began in 2017, which attempts to renegotiate larger perspectives of the city, dig deeper and capture its essence in its ever-changing rhythms and nuances. Our journey, we've explored businesses, brands, heritage, philanthropy, art and technology, urban subcultures, maritime cultures, along with architects, historians, designers, artists, poets, artists, um, female theater stalwarts, wildlife activists, and how they have influenced our city. We've held workshops that have looked at the iconic Mumbai architecture, namely of Art Deco, Indo-Saracenic, and Victorian Gothic. And now, in honor of International Museum Day 2019, we turn our attention to some of the most unique and innovative and unconventional museums of Mumbai and how they've influenced the way our city has been shaped. The National Gallery of Modern Art, Mumbai, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, and Avid Learning present Multipolis Mumbai, Museums and the City. This program is a continuation of AVID's collaboration with the NGMA, and I'd like to thank Mrs. Anita Rupavatram and Shruti Das for giving us this opportunity again. Um, we have Shruti with us. Shruti Das is the Deputy Curator at the NGMA. I'm just request her to say a few words before I introduce the panel. Thanks, Asa, for giving me the opportunity to welcome all of you. This day is quite a special for us. This program is being organized by the National Gallery of Modern Art and Avid Learning on the occasion of International Museum Day. International Museum Day, you must be knowing or may not be. It is to raise awareness of the fact that museums are an important means of cultural exchange, enrichment of cultures and development of mutual understanding, cooperation, and peace among peoples. Organized on 18th May each year or around this day, the events and activities planned to celebrate International Museum Day can last a day, a weekend, or entire week. So by the help of every learning, we have organized this talk. IMD was celebrated for the first time 40 years ago. All around the world, more and more museums participated in International Museum Day. Last year, more than 37,000 museums participated in the event in about 158 countries and territories. I hope you all will organize, you all will enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Shruti. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome on stage our panel of experts. Uh, we have Director, Archaeology and Museums, Government of Maharashtra, Dr. Tejas Garge. Creative Coordinator, Dharavi Design Museum on Wheels, Kruti Saraya. <laughs> Object Theater Artist, Artistic Director, Tram Art Trust, Co-Founder, Museum of Ordinary Objects in India, Choiti Ghosh. <laughs> and our moderator for the evening, Museum Consultant and Oral Historian, Avehi Menon. For more about our, each of our esteemed panelists, uh, please refer to the bio handouts that have been distributed. Uh, now what you need to do is take this phone out, put it on silent, you may not even get a service out here, but start using them, start posting, reposting, tagging. Our handle is at Avid Learning, and hashtag is learning never stops. Thank you very much. Over to you, Avehi, and look forward to an exciting discussion. Okay, 
Thank you, Asad, and thank you, Avid Learning, for organizing this event. I think it's an important conversation to have and to keep continuously having. Um, so just before we begin, how, you know, by a show of hands, how many of you have visited a museum in the last six months? Wow, okay. How many of you have visited more than one museum in the last six months? Okay, great. So we have our potential visitor base uh, right here. Um, so just before we begin the panel, I'd like to give a bit of context into what we're going to be sort of discussing today. Um, museums are not static institutions. They've evolved over time for different purposes and serve different purposes. Um, they began in India as a colonial assertion, documenting, collecting, displaying the empire. Post-independence, they served a young nation in um, creating a sense of pride, national identity, um, a sense of heritage. But now there's a reimagining, a repurposing that's taking place in the museum sector. If we look at museums that focus on social political issues, like the museum set up by survivors of the Bhopal gas disaster, or the partition museum that is taking stories, narratives, memories that were earlier suppressed, or Virasati Khalsa in Anandpur Sahib, which is an experiential space that evokes a sense of wonder, even though it has very few objects in its collection. Or Arna Jharna, a museum in Rajasthan, that's very important because it's documenting local uh, flora and fauna, uh, craft traditions of the community in which it's located. The other significant development is that, and this is happening globally, is a shift from collections to community. Museums are placing visitors and communities at the heart of what they do in order to remain connected, in order to remain relevant. So in some sense, museums are saying we're giving up being custodians of knowledge, singular, authoritative, to being participatory, inclusive, to say, come in and share your knowledge with us. Um, and I think this is very exciting because it ties in with the theme of International Museum Day 2019, which is museums as cultural hubs and looking at museums as sort of active participants in their community. And therefore, it's even more exciting to have such, an, uh, you know, such a distinguished panel with us, which is going to take us through museums in the city, uh, which are reimagining that traditional idea of the museum, and what it means to us as visitors, as museum professionals, and as a city. Um, so to begin with an overarching question to the three of you, uh, what, according to you, is the idea and purpose of a museum? Well, then let me start officially being uh, <laughs> government governmental curator of the museums in the state of Maharashtra. Uh, definitely, let me start with my childhood. My own idea of uh, museum in childhood was amusement. That was the first emotion that I got connected with museums. I come from a small town called Nashik, and with my parents, I often used to come to CSMVS. At that point of time, it was Prince of Wales, and still in my heart, it is Prince of Wales to me. And that evoked a lot of emotions, a lot of curiosity in my own mind, that I get to see so many strange objects in one place. And I, I think that amusement continued and it has driven me here where I'm sitting today. So in simple words, it's a collection of objects which gives you information, which generates your curiosity. And I think uh, it is more of a collection of ideas and traditions, which is the theme of uh, this year's uh, UNESCO's World, Heritage, uh, World Museum Day. So that is how I see a museum. So I'm going to put a disclaimer out there before I start speaking, is that I'm not from the museum circles. I'm a theater artist. <laughs> so I'm going to speak from uh, the very limited experience of, of being a museum viewer and with the Museum of Ordinary Objects, which was my first um, making of a museum. Uh, and it, I think it's only after that, after the experience of uh, Moo, which we call, we call it Moo, uh, that we started thinking about museums very seriously. And I think f what it has become for us now, it's what it has become for me now, uh, is a window. 
we look at uh, uh, we look at we look at the displays we look at the objects that we are displaying in the museum we look at it as windows through which we look at uh, people at communities at histories at um, even a sense of imagination which uh, uh, can sort of go spiraling um, that's that's what it is for me now Kriti? Um, so at the risk of you know sitting on in a museum uh, with this in this event I'm still gonna say that museums as a child for me was a very boring place that it was you know somewhere where your parents dragged you every time you went to a new city and then it was like oh when is this going to get over mm -hmm. so uh, it's actually for me it's really interesting that this definition of the museum where it's not just stuffed animal heads and uh, you know old like renaissance paintings but there's more and i think my maybe the you know the place that changed my perception of what a museum was was london that when i went to the tate for the first time the tate modern and i realized that there was stuff that you know we could talk about that was relevant that was current uh, there was stuff that shocked me there was uh, you know things that just didn't belong to history but you know there was also like different aspects it in that way like it changed my perception of what a museum is and to further it now with you know things like Mu or things like what I did with uh, you know what I was a part of in Dharavi that it's pushing that definition further and hence makes it more interesting right and I uh, I'm also going to call it Mu uh, and I think with Mu and with you know, the design museum Tharavi, you still use the idea of a museum. And, and that's where museums have also evolved, right? Of what we've seen that they've moved from an institution to an idea, they've expanded. Uh, and both of you have used that idea of a museum in your own way. What is it about the museum then that helps it accommodate all these different forms and types within it? Um, so you've used the museum as an idea to to uh, talk about ordinary objects. Why the museum? What is it about the museum? We debated then? about this. Mm -hmm. We debated about this, and uh, we we appro we we didn't set out to build a museum. We set out to uh, we set out to help people look at objects the way we look at objects, uh, and. And then, after much brainstorming, we were, we, we were wondering why is it called the Museum of Ordinary Objects? Why is it not an exhibit of ordinary objects? Mm. And uh, I think because we wanted to uh, give, a, uh, give a large worldness that, uh, that, the, that, museums, that museums carry, the, the many branches out and the many windows through which you can look into it and the many connections that it makes. Uh, that's why we decided that it, it is a museum and the objects that go into it are the exhibits. Um, the, the, our our uh, intention was also to give status to ordinary, hmm. to uh, raise value of what are generally considered unimportant hmm. and to show the art within the, within that and uh, i think and I, let's say we piggybacked on museums right. to do that hmm. uh, so with design museum dharavi it was you know i think it actually started in the reverse where the entire experiment was actually to say that what happens you know, to a museum, when you take it out of the white box, when you more importantly take it to a people who didn't even understand 
the definition of museum. So we initially, when we were on ground, there were so many suggestions, which you know started from polite suggestions to fierce arguments, yeah. saying, "But these guys are not gonna understand," you know. You are, and we had two people from Amsterdam, like it's their brainchild. They wanted to come and do it. Hawke and Amanda. So it was like, you are white people, you don't understand the context of India, you know, you're in Tharavi, uh, they, you know, these are people you're talking to, they do not understand the word museum. So change it to something else, like, you know, change it to uh, exhibition or a mela or something that they can own. Uh, but, you know, the whole, for them, the whole experiment, the idea that they started with was to say that no, but you know, we want to experiment with the idea of the museum. If it's no longer that, then we are, we have nothing to do here. So it was that then how do you introduce an idea of what a museum means to a people who have absolutely no clue, who never heard this word before. Hmm. And I think that was to see what happens that do, you know, is there still the same sort of interaction? Is there the same reverence of the object, the same celebration, or, you know, does that also turn on its head uh, when you put it in that context of Dharavi? Hmm. Uh, and in and both your spaces, in some sense, you flip the idea of the kind or type of objects we usually see in a museum context, um, you know, and what we consider a value in a museum context, ordinary objects and you co-created objects. Um, how did that sort of decision come about? How do you go about, if you could tell us a bit more about how do you go about collecting and curating um, for the museum? The value of the objects that come into our museum is, is the value that is endowed by the giver. Mm. Uh, because these are all objects that we live with every day. Uh, and whether we know it or not, uh, we have memories. We have associations with all these objects. And uh, it was, it's the museum's job to trigger that. Uh, so the first museum when we started, uh, it was largely the three of us, the three co-founders of the MU that who collected all our objects, put it together. But ours is a, a touch-friendly, barter-friendly museum. Mm. So which means that over days, the exhibit keeps changing. So, uh, the things that you see on day one are not the things that you see on day two or day three. Uh, but everything comes with a story. Everything comes with a little bit of the time that they have spent in your lives. And then they suddenly became, like I said, a portal through which we were looking at another person, it's anonymous, at a person that you don't know, and that story then triggers something in your mind, something that you may have experienced, you may have lived through. Then over time, uh, our objects became lesser and lesser. The last museum that we did was in Delhi, uh, which was our first very concerted community exercise. It was meant for a community and where there were so many crowdsourced objects, we just had no space for our own. We took bags and suitcases full of our things and we had to bring them all back. Mm. <laughs> over one month, uh, the community had donated so many things. We had over 400 objects in a tiny little room. Um, and this, this is a migrant community, largely a migrant working com worker community. So there were things like old plastic cups and uh, broken spoons. And I think the most precious object that we might have collected from that community would have been an uh, old uh, one of those. You remember those hotshot cameras that no longer exist? Uh, but one of those old hotshot cameras that don't work anymore, but have been preserved because it is probably one of the most expensive things that the family had bought. And they saved it and they put it in the museum and it became a really interesting rallying point for people from outside the community who had come to it, come for the museum. And were they writing labels for these objects? Yes. So? We went and collected stories. Uh, Anna, and uh, the stories are usually from five to six lines to one word. Sometimes, the, sometimes it's a blank card. Sometimes you don't even have a story because the object is potent enough to evoke your own story. It doesn't need an external endowment. 
Uh, and this is something that we consciously built in from the first moon itself, is that we start with longer stories and the stories become more and more and more and more cryptic as you walk your way inside the museum till the last set of objects, you don't need stories anymore. Okay, Prithi, if you could tell us about the process and then I'd like to bring Dr. Karge in. Um, so with uh, in Dharavi, the whole idea was actually that it was a museum by the people, for the people, uh, you know, kind of thing. So the lead up to, because the exhibition, technically the museum was on only for like, you know, the two days of, like it was like a pop-up at the, but the process was on for like usually a month or three months before that. Um, the interesting part over here was to have the community talk to each other. So Dharavi is essentially divided by trade. So all the potters are in like one section and all the recycle work happens in another space. And then there are the leather workers and so on. So we would kind of work with one community and then actually exhibit it in a different place. And it was what was also a discovery for us was that there was so much sudden wonder within the community saying, oh, like there's all this pottery that's happening in our neighborhood, we had no idea. And you would think as outsiders that, dude, everybody knows that, you know, Dharavi has a pottery community, but within their little worlds, they are so insular that you know, there was that sense of wonder, there was, you know, a certain access. So we actually got some of the potters to get their wheel and then work with some of the children of like the other communities. And there was, they were like lining up to, you know, have their hand at it to say, oh wow, like this is down the road, like we had no idea. And it was that sort of, you know, community exchange where we got these people to actually move out of their comfort zone in a way which was still right next to each other to come there. So it was not about anybody else in the city, like it was great that people came and they saw and you know they got access, but it was so much about with communities to create, you know, just spaces for them to interact. And over how long was this a sort of a collaboration in some sense with the community? Uh, so it lasted a year, but there were three exhibitions that happened and one was based around pottery and uh, the second one was a cricket match that we had and that was based around, uh, you know, working with wood and recycled material and stuff like that. And uh, the third one was with the leather workers, but working in tarpaulin because, you know, that's what Dharavi gets covered with. So it was... Um, three exhibitions, you know, which each lasted about three to five days each. But the process, the on-ground process was over a whole year. Um, so Dr. Karge, sorry, just to bring you in now, um, to talk about collaboration, which is far more than just outreach. This is, you know, building sort of deeper relationships with the community. Um, how do you feel that conversation has changed within the state departments or state museums, this conversation of going beyond outreach to building relationships with the community? Well, let me start with your first question. Uh, though it was not addressed to me, uh, I'm taking a little liberty to uh, why museum? Because it's a constitution of government of India that it's government responsibility to look after culture, heritage. So you have department like Archaeological Survey of India and you have in the in number of uh, museum to put all the historical objects. Well, so we are fulfilling condition put forward by the Constitution of India and we are doing our duty. And it is assumed that uh, Community, community participation are still kind of fancy words for government department, though we never use it. But if you look at museums with government of Maharashtra, there are only half of the museums which are created with efforts of the government. We do have 13 museums, and out of which five museums are donations of private individuals. So, um, and that private effort uh, did not come uh, single-handedly. There was a community behind it, and there was a joint effort from people, and that was a spontaneous effort, 
which was later on supported by the government. So I think there's already a community participation happening over the long period of time. But I think we still need to learn uh, Mm, jaggery of the words and uh, marketing a bit, I guess. But I think community participation is already happening. But again, largely it is about the objects which are of historical importance, which are left behind by the kings or queens or rich persons or uh, people who had uh, a, a lot of creativity that should be preserved for the posterity. But now, definitely we are looking beyond that. And we are also catering the interest of common people. I, every day I get n number of requests to preserve collection by XYZ person. Uh, handicraft items or paper craft items or the postal stamp collections, coins, is a, uh, n number of agencies to do that. But it's a variety of objects that people are collecting and they are expecting that government should take this forward, mm. government should sponsor it. So mm, we are already there. We just need to market our work. That's all I guess. Mm. But in terms of sort of engagement activities at these museums, you right. know, reaching out to, I mean schools are one large kind mm -hmm. of audience that you cater to in some sense. But beyond schools, are there other audiences you're thinking of? See, two years back, um, we did not have any interaction programs. We're like a typical static government department. Uh, we did not even observe our Saujanya Saptahas. See, in Archaeological Survey of India, at least uh, we were being courteous enough to people and uh, media in World Heritage Week that we would be more open, we would go to public, we would talk to them. And uh, later for the rest of the year, we'll shut ourselves wide. So, uh, and I think uh, there's a reason for that kind of policy. Uh, but uh, since last two years, uh, we have been ob observing uh, International Museum Day, World Heritage Week, and uh, we just look for occasion. And uh, in 13 museums across the state, now we have started a number of programs. First of all, by inviting schools, and we give assignments to the children that they should draw something from the museum. Let it be copy to start with. Or some essay about what they have seen. Uh, we don't assign topics to them. We just take a guide, we just give them a guided tour and just we try to understand their perception, mm. what they have received out of it. Like she said, it, it was kind of a very boring memory. So even I have seen uh, people, uh, students coming to Ajanta and hardly realizing what they are saying. They just, just walk off. So even I was curious if a student goes in a group or if he's an individual, what he gets out of museum. So essay forces him or her to think. Right. So we are initiating that kind of programs. But, uh, and we also had tie up with CSMVS. Uh, uh, the bus on wheels, it came to our three, four museums. So uh, we had contacted uh, education officer of concerned district. He wrote back to schools and there was a wonderful response. Uh, people did not know that uh, there is a museum which exists in our own district and they came there because of this bus. Mm. So they got to see the uh, museum on wheels plus our museum. And we also facilitated communication wherever students could not come in some rural areas or the schools did not have school buses or they did not have enough fundings to bring uh, children to the uh, museum. We took that bus over there. So I think in the last one year, we were able to reach to about uh, 40,000 students in district of Kolhapur, Usmanabad and Aurangabad. And here focus is more on non-urban areas mm. because in urban areas we are lucky enough to have museums and it is part of our urban lifestyle. But in rural areas, uh, I mean that, that opportunity is not there right. and luckily many of our museums are situated in rural areas. So we thought of uh, doing this program with CSMVS 
and Deji was kind enough to agree with that and he did send bus on uh, our request free of cost okay. and secondly we are also getting in touch with art groups because uh, traditionally as a department of archaeology we never bothered about contemporary art or 19th century art or 20th century art or even contemporary is out of question for archaeology okay. But now we are having dialogues with local societies. We are offering our museum spaces free of cost for non-commercial exhibitions. Or uh, if there is an event related to promotion of art and culture, we are making our spaces available to them free of cost. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you there. This idea of the, then the museum as a cultural hub or right. as a community space. Right. Did you see that at the Museum of Ordinary Objects or I mean at the Dharavi Design Museum, where the museum serves as that community space and, and what were people's responses then to that museum? Or I, think, space? I think our job at Mu is already a little bit easier because uh, the objects that are on display are they're already they're already a ready everyday part of the community uh, so we don't have to work very hard at that uh, they're crowdsourced they're even if you haven't given it you know it you live with it um, the own which which makes which is in, it's which is why it is inherently not an alienating space it's inherently a space where you walk in and you recognize everything. Um, the the last muse, the last move that we did was in uh, was in Delhi, which is which was our first concerted community effort. Um, it was uh, it was a I, f I think it was a it was quite riveting. It was a bit of a. Uh, I still get uh, bumps thinking about it uh, because uh, when 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 you have when our volunteers went from home to home collecting objects uh, and like I said they collected over 400 a lot of the times people are giving away things that they no longer need so this empty cup this empty thing and then when they come to the museum and they see that empty cup that they had just given as a throwaway on a pedestal covered in a beautiful black on a beautiful black cloth with a spotlight under it over it it does something uh, it changes how you look at yourself yeah. it changes how you look at your community uh, it changes how you look at the your neighbor whose home you may or may not have seen that object in and you've and you've for the first time, maybe found out something about your neighbor that you did hadn't thought of before. It's a very ordinary thing. It could be something very sim simply, very some something like "Meri nani ko dahej me mila tha." It could be something as simple as that. "Apki nani ko bhi mila tha." "Meri nani ko bhi mila tha." But it's 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 a moment that builds connections, yeah. and the these. These are, these are connections that are also individual because you suddenly feel a connection through that object with the giver. It's also a community connection. Right. And this you can feel palpably. And I think it is because, I think it is because they are familiar, because you know you can own them. Right. Um, in the context of Dharavi, first of all, you know, doing different sort of events. So as I said that with, you know, the cricket bat exhibition, there was a small little cricket match. And uh, I think one of the things it did was that it had a kind of audience, which are like these young boys who, you know, all they want to do is play cricket, actually come into a space like that or, you know, actually get exposed to these bats being exhibited and then saying oh you know can we play with them or like you know what do you do with these things so you suddenly a had an audience who would not come to this kind of an event mm. which was, who they were actually coming they were actually engaging 
the second is that the moment they would hear that okay you know whatever's on display and you know again same kind of reverence of the exhibit of the podium or of a, you know our our museum was a thela essentially but the fact that it was lit up or it was you know there was a little bit of fanfare around there uh there was a lot of community pride saying ha ha hamare dharavi se bana hai mm. so even the fact that they had nothing to do with it that they hadn't actually like made the object themselves or uh, you know had but it was like there was suddenly this that yes you know this comes from our space and hence we have an inherent pride about it and um in some sense i think now addressing the three of you um having spaces and i know you spoke about this recently about museums um moving from you know south bombay or south mumbai to moving them out to navi mumbai or the suri fort um how is it having sort of cultural hubs or museums in neighborhood in different neighborhoods uh what does that do to the access to culture how does that um make it more accessible as i said earlier i had to come down to south mumbai all the way from nasik just to see a museum even today i think situation is, has not changed uh if you go to suburb ask me how many art galleries are there how many museums i mean we won't be even able to name half a dozen art galleries forget museums so are we are we really catering to the suburban crowds as a policy makers or uh, as uh, being professional museologist or artist are we catering enough to the suburban crowd or uh, suburban crowd is mindless or they don't need it i'm sure that is not the fact Uh, so many people who come from uh, like the uh, travel at least for couple of hours just to get to these places so why not to move out of south bombay of course being here is very prestigious thing uh, so far there is no state dip, uh, state museum of maharashtra many people thought that chhatrapati shivaji vastu sangrahalay is state government entity but let me tell you it is not the state government of maharashtra does not exist and when this idea was put forward the first answer from mantale was the space we don't have any space and looking for a space in south mumbai as it said i don't need space in south mumbai we need to move out and i'm sure if you put something of worth people will travel that distance so is there is there a plan in place for smaller museums uh, uh well uh, we have our uh, forts and some protected monuments within bombay for example uh, our fort at worli it remains a very popular destination for film shootings similarly there is another fort called shivdi and it has got a huge warehouses of uh, colonial period and uh, they are the, uh, they are just lying vacant they are not being used for anything so why not to create some of the spaces uh, into museums or spaces of cultural hubs i would love to have a concert concert of a western classical music uh, by the bay uh, right in front of early fort why it is not illuminated in the night uh, let us have a uh, kavali at uh, shivdi fort why not so i think policy is changing and now uh, there is a mo- more positive approach uh, towards uh, public and private partnerships i think uh, csmvs and bahudaji lard museum are some wonderful examples uh, with the public outreach programs and uh, government museums are also collaborating with them and we hope to take this forward instead of having a giant in south bombay we can split our collections we can select some suburban areas and we can have n number of smaller entities yeah. and uh, we have also initiated dialogue with uh, all these municipal corporations for example mira bhinder sai and uh, there are a lot of cultural remains some sculptures and there's a popular demand from public as well 
Uh, so we are talking to the concerned municipal commissioners. Uh, if we get space and permissions, we are hoping to have these small museums in the suburban areas as well. Okay. Being in Dharavi and in terms of, I wouldn't say access to culture, but what does that do to the idea of, let's say, art and culture in, in that space because it's situated within the museum? Um, so I'm actually going to kind of borrow this line from a little kid in Dharavi and uh, you know this was I was setting up the museum the third show one and it was just the empty cart there was nothing up there and there were two kids behind me and they were having this conversation which I eavesdrop on and uh, this one kid says so what what's going on here like you know, what are they going to do? Are they going to sell something? Are they going to give us like free things? What's going on? And this other kid very smartly who, who possibly had some idea who had, you know, seen one of the earlier exhibits or I don't know whether it was out of his imagination says, uh, you know, this is like a magic show except it has no tricks. <laughs> <laughs> And when I heard those sort of, and you know, this is kind of one instance, but when I heard those sort of conversations between the kids, uh, you know, coming and sort of asking questions or, you know, interacting with these objects, some of them were broken, some of them were, you know, all of that happened. It was not without, it was not this, oh my God, wow, you know, this is so lovely. But I think when I heard some of those sort of interactions, I was like, oh, this is the point of bringing, you know, this is, this becomes their way of interpreting culture or, you know, their access to, you know, something that they hadn't seen before, that it's magic, yeah. you know, that culture becomes magic. That's lovely because, uh, <laughs> you know, colloquially also, uh, museums were called Jadugar, which is houses of wonder and magic. So that's quite lovely that it, it resonates. Um, and in terms of like sort of the development of cultural hubs, um, what do you think uh, we need to do within the city? What are some of the challenges to the development of you know, cultural hubs in the cities, the big challenges? Name one. Space. Of course. Space. Okay. <laughs> I would also think, uh, you know, that I feel like there's control in the hands of few. There is like so curation. So, for instance, at a lot of big festivals, we'll see the same names of artists, karigars, whatever, like over and over again, and it's sort of non-democratic in that way you know, which uh, is a big hindrance for people who really want to do new things. Uh, so unless, you know, so there, it took somebody from Amsterdam to come and kind of initiate mm. this project because in like the larger bodies within the city are kind of getting stuck in red tape saying, oh, okay, do you know somebody? Like then this can happen. But otherwise it's, you have to be known already to get access to do something. Yeah. And I think that's in the entire art and culture space, like whether you're a dancer, whether it's theater, like for anybody who wants to actually put out something new out there, that's such a big hindrance thing. But where have you been? Where have you exhibited? What have you done? <laughs> and it's like, oh, uh, but I need to do it once to answer that question again. But can I just add something? Having said space now, I will also add that now is much easier because of... Uh, because of breaking down of ideas of what a new museum needs to look like, mm. what a theater space needs to look like. And we have, we've really experienced because we, uh, we run one of these tiny little spaces that can hold, um, and the, pro uh, the owner of the space is sitting here, uh, that can hold 60, 70 uh, audiences, not, particularly comfortably, though we try very hard to make it comfortable, and they don't seem to mind. Uh, I think these uh, uh, little spaces, I think it, uh, if, because they're breaking ideas of, uh, it's, it's okay if it's chipped, it's okay if I have to crowd a little bit, but it's bringing, it's, it's uh, building a kind of complicity between the community and between the programmers that we are, we are doing this because the programmers are not in, in, I think, 
our case is the programmer is not an outsider of the community is also mm. public so we are we are trying you try too mm. and uh, this i think we need to make things like this work for us rather than uh, being uh, i think a lot of the challenges might become easier if we break the ideas of what these things are of what the uh, so performance spaces yes, yeah. yes 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 and because we really have seen that the viewer or the audience doesn't mind being squished a little bit but the idea of like the pop up or the ephemeral space which are, which both of yours have been like now the dharavi design museum is shut yes. in some sense um and uh, yours has traveled what does that do to sort of building of those communities and creating sustained relationships does that change that dynamic or in some sense you're creating access wherever you go how how do you see that uh, well we are going wherever we find access honestly and uh, when we are going into a community uh, every new community we need somebody there we need a local person there who is part of the community because we can't just drop in from in our helicopters and say ab to hum museum banayenge we can't do that uh what and the when it traveled for the first time and it went to delhi it was called for the specific purpose of uh of uh, becoming friends with the becoming deeper friends with the community we were called for that reason uh because uh, the the space has been around in the community for a little while but and this is one way that they can build more uh which is why we were there Okay, sorry. Was that not your question? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, <laughs> I was just asking for the time. Um, no, that's that. I, I, I understand that. And and maybe in terms of what you've heard from both of them, what are the learnings you think that we could take from um, museums that are alternative? It's a it's a large term, but museums like theirs, which are community driven, idea driven. I think uh, government should entertain such ideas. Uh, alternative uh, ways of doing things, thinking out of the box. Um, as she mentioned earlier, you have to uh, know somebody, or you have to have connections. But I would uh, beg to differ with you a bit, uh, because many of our museums uh, were creations of common people. You may not have heard name of somebody called Baya Sahib Patil. but he is from pathan and now there is a museum in his name set up by the government so you have to have uh, that kind of effort that even government realizes that you need to do it and i'll emphasize this on a public platform because uh, there were simultaneously there were two proposals uh, with government and due to financial constraints we had to choose one and you will be surprised to know the other name it was collection of karl khandelwala along with his banglo in pune in cambodia but government chose somebody called baba saheb patil from pathan because he had absolutely no resources to keep those objects he had no resources to uh, build a building or to do anything with his own uh, collection so sometimes there are some uh, unknown facts even within the government functionings which support common people so you have to have a genuine efforts and again going back to your previous question it has to be a choice of a community it has to be our choice a cultural choice that we choose in family I mean, today, how many of us, or maybe many of us sitting here, might raise their hands when we say that uh, our choice of taking our kids to mall or museum? Of course, all of us are going to raise our hands for museum. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, who would prefer to take them to malls? Why not some innovative idea of combining mall and a museum? why not some common culture uh, uh, cultural spaces in a place like a mall nowadays malls are serving as cultural hubs 
they are serving largely as meeting points where people get together go out hang out spend some time then why not to club this both why not to have some dedicated spaces or it it may largely come up with a changing policies of government that if you are raising a mall you have to have certain square uh, amount of square feets dedicated for the cultural activities and that to uh, with a very little amount of charges but of course we don't have that kind of yeah. innovative thinking in government setup itself and you know uh, again if you go back to set of existing government and financial rules it's very hard to change them all of a sudden if i want to hire you today for doing uh, some activity for my museums i have a long process to follow and uh, i i would be happy that if i am able to do that before my retirement <laughs> <laughs> but but there is a innovative way out today we are sitting on a common platform which is again a collaborative effort of uh, a government body and a private body of course uh, avid learning and a government body can sit together and uh, have her uh, and i can offer a government space a government collection and uh, we can take it to public so there are certain shortcuts you just need to be innovative and be right. little out of the box i mean i think there's already a museum at the airport so you know there are there are those avenues and maybe the focus should be strengthening the institutions that we have the government institutions we have and sort of changing them and learning from um th these sort of spaces and how they do engagement in how they're thinking about objects and curation and display um the sort of future trajectories what you're doing next with the museum of ordinary objects today we are deciding the next date because <laughs> my partners are sitting there um the the next museum is going to be uh, a little bit done a little bit differently with the same objective a little bit differently than we've done it before this is really an initial conversations right now but we've always had uh, a collection drive uh, which is which is a hidden collection drive nobody i mean only we know who's given what and then it ends with a two day or three day or a 10 day uh, like it was in delhi uh, pop up museum and then it goes off again but now we are thinking that we do uh, small on display collection drives over over a month okay and now i've said it now we have to do it like this <laughs> <laughs> over a It's month been recorded and uh, <laughs> uh which leads up to the larger museum and uh, which is and these smaller drives are with uh small focuses certain kind of objects in june another kind in july and then maybe in december these dates are not uh, yeah no problem <laughs> we get a, we get a sense of <laughs> and then in december it's uh, all encompassing this is the thought this is the germ of the thought and then i we sort of tend to uh, take uh, the previous experience into the next so uh, we don't have a five years later this is what it's going to be uh, we have a sense of what the next one is going to be and the one after that we'll know after this one okay okay great anything uh, with the design museum in dharavi or your other projects um so you know as as you all know that it ran for a year and then it ended so um the the idea over here is that yeah there might not be another reopening of the design museum dharavi but it would be great to you know for it to serve as like the seed that it can happen anywhere you know that it can you can go into any other community in bombay or you know anywhere else and make this thing happen yeah. that and the whole model is there like for instance this museum lives online so you can go on to the website you can see the collection that was uh you know of what the potters made of what the broom makers made all of that and you can hear those stories you can kind of read the case study and i think that's what that's the way in which the museum hopes to live on saying you know it serves as a model for you to just 
not wait for that big thing for that big moment to kind of go out and do it and say okay you know if it works it works and if it doesn't work there's still something you know we learned from it right okay great i think we'll open it up to the audience any questions asad museums and for the arts in general you know when it's sustainable when it's it's building capital it's building uh, you know e economy you know from the um, it makes it more sustainable in the long term now i don't see why not because we have obviously such amazing museums which have been not monetized correctly it put it on the tourist map i mean we don't really have a formalized i mean i don't know how closely is tourism associated with our heritage and our museum so that's one one part of it and you barely touched on technology but looking at technology because that's the drive especially for these alternate city based museum which is the topic of today is can you'll talk about how technology can be leveraged i mean you know google culture lab aside but there are many other other platforms similar to that so so yeah so uh, touching upon the technology bit i think that that was also like the very important shift from saying that you know when we did our exhibitions we didn't collect the objects we returned them back and it was enough that it was documented on the online space and you know it did its job so suddenly this existence of the website and for it to have been documented um, you know felt enough for you not to have this large storage space or not to have to actually own the object but create that distance and say yes we can you know this is done we can give it away i think it's the same similar thing mm. it goes back right so i think that big shift that technology has bought from having to hoard objects store them preserve them be in charge of actually like be responsible for their safe keeping to say you know it's told its story and the story has been documented so now we can move on and the tech, like online space allows you that like really lovely i think so if i can also uh, contribute i think technology is a great tool that's been used uh, globally to democratize the collections right to offer access to um, a get people to know the collection sort of virtually before uh, coming to the museum and being used as a tool through apps through interactives within the space um and i think with let's say sarmaya which is a virtual museum in bombay um based in mumbai you know showing that showing collections online interacting so deeply through social media is also talking about uh, or turning the idea of the museum on its head um but i think technology is a great tool so sorry Yes. Yeah, I mean, when I uh, started preparing for interview of this director's post, I googled Department of Archaeology and Museums, Government of Maharashtra. <laughs> I did not find anything. <laughs> so, first and foremost task was to prepare a website. And for first six months, there was little struggle because there was already a, a website in place. of department of cultural affairs and we did have a page on that which was non interactive so it took some time uh, to convince people in mantale and luckily then we had uh, mr bhushan gagani who is very well versed with trends in art and culture and he was kind enough to permit uh, an attache office a separate department to have its own website separate from the government website so uh, we are working on it uh, and we started with great enthusiasm so there was lot of data in english and then we realized that it has to have a first page in marathi so translating <laughs> that whole data into marathi is taking some time but we are hoping to launch it by this uh, august so we will exist on google this year year onwards and uh, to talk about ajanta and nilara uh so digital documentation is very important because we don't know what will last for posterity the physical building the physical object it, uh, as per um, law of nature it has to decay 
and uh, our works are a little unrealistic. Uh, go, uh, we are working against the law of nature. We are trying to stop or slow that decay. Or we are just trying to hand it over to the next generation. But I'm not sure how long we'll be able to do that. So digital documentation is going to help it immensely. It is going to help it uh, preserve it in some or other form for the posterity. So ultimately, it's all about preservation of forms. And uh, second uh, point was tourism. So uh, we have 13 museums. And uh, one of our museums in Kolhapur is tied up with Deccan Odyssey. So uh, Deccan Odyssey stops at Kolhapur. And we have frequent visitors to that particular museum. But we need to have a better dialogue with uh, people in tourism department or the private tour operators uh, to include us in the circuits. So, uh, and we also don't have any budgetary provisions for publicity and marketing. I think website is going to solve that problem a bit in coming years. But uh, I'm also trying to perceive government to have, uh, to allocate us funds even for publicity. So uh, we can also hire uh, people from private sector uh, to market our works, uh, to tell the rest of the world that we exist. So interactives within the museum, yes. Choyti, do you have something to say about technology and cultural hubs in the museum or how it... <laughs> Again, a small initiative is uh, making an app um, dedicated to each museum. And see, n uh, nowadays, we, all of us, we have this toy. So we don't need to have uh, those heavy duty machines in museums uh, to take a tour. So we can have one interactive app, and we can simply move around with our smartphone inside museum by plugging earplugs. Uh, we did some experiments uh, in fo form of beacon transmitters. For example, there's a small transmitter put on showcase, you go into vicinity of that, and uh, the object will talk to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is still uh, in process, and we failed at certain places. But what we have done at Nagpur, uh, we have put up QR codes. So you simply scan that QR code. Uh, the information will be on your screen. And we are waiting for some budgets so that we can have voiceover, and uh, one can listen to that information while watching that object. So uh, a lot of plans, and we'll come up with something good in future. But you know, in kind of conjunction with these like efforts, like I, I do feel that equal emphasis needs to be put on the content, because so many times it's like, yes, there is a QR code, or yes, there is an audio guide, or there's an app on my phone. But you know, there's not been enough time and effort put into somebody actually writing that content well, or making it interesting. And you know, it's just factual information which I can read. Like it's still telling me the same thing that oh, this object, this and this year, you know, from this and this king or whatever else it. But it's not telling me anything more. And I think that sometimes I just feel that oh, you know, instead of investing all this money in technology, if you got a good historian on board <laughs> who would just write really well, it would be like m money better spent. Yeah. <laughs> Something to okay, say. so after this, we'll open it out to questions. Uh, uh, because because the move pops up from time to time in different places, uh, we also wanted to have a, a space where people who are not able to physically come to the museum uh, to be able to share their objects. So we did create an Instagram page with that objective. Uh, that because the objects are crowdsourced, they're also virtually crowdsourced. So everything that has physically come into the museum is all up on the page. But objects that have not physically come into the museum, but is in your home and you want to share it, is also shared on that mm. page. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a, uh, it, the museum remains alive. Mm. Right. I mean, finally, technology is a tool. And I think it has to be guided by a certain kind of vision and mission. Uh, you know, from the institution. Uh, should we open up, open it up to questions? I think we have one there, and then yeah. Malvika. 
Um, I have a bit of a point on the technology thing and on building audio guides and using technological tools. I built audio guides for the ASI for four years and our biggest hindrance, quite frankly, was the ASI. Um, we built state-of-the-art, interactive, uh, location-aware audio guides and, and, um, and, and I have a degree, so a master's in interpretation. And our biggest problem was that we were private and to get government contracts was impossible. We were, by the way, the official audio guide at the Taj Mahal for those four years and the Agra Fort and uh, Khajrao. Um, the, one of the problems with technology does exist. I'm just copying. This is working. It exists. It's there. I don't know how many people are willing to accept it. And a big problem is also that in India, we're not exposed to these things. People who came and worked in our office itself, I had to sit them down on their first day and say, look, this is what an audio guide is. This is what we're creating together. So I completely agree with Kruti um, about, you know, it needs to be done well. One. But two, it does exist. You know, when you talk about QR codes and things, things were talk, they're, they're a little bit outdated. So why are we just catching up to that as government institutions? Why are we not embracing things? And by the way, we stopped functioning simply because we, the government refused to give us business. And um, why aren't we using things that are available? Why aren't we using, where's the training in India? Where's the, I can point out about five people in this room who will do outreach and marketing and but why is it so difficult for them to work today with the government and make this happen? People, if there are people here. Why is there no training here, and why is why is the government willing to kind of move with the text? So that's a bit of a. Would you like to respond to that? Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, uh, to start with, uh, 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 of course, we need to work on content more. Uh, but as a government agency, uh, we are there to present the facts. Of course, uh, if it is, uh, if there is an inscription inscribed by a king, so we have to speak of that king and we have to narrate that boring information in which a common public may not be interested. But that's a no, fix. Yeah. That's that's a fix and first and foremost thing that we need to do, which is mandatory as a government department to do one thing but uh, i agree with you that we are not good storytellers mm -hmm. so we need to work with you more to convert our data into stories and uh, coming to your question i uh, don't know why government failed to give you business uh, but certainly we are open for technology and people who approach us uh, and uh, question why government is not opting for the latest uh, I I should not be using this pl uh, platform to talk about my own constraints right so I will not go into details uh, about my budgetary provisions and why uh, well, the latest technology is expensive and uh, you work with people who are trained in uh, Stone Age period uh, I had a boss who had a question to me that if I'm staying in Delhi, how my email will reach to Lucknow if I'm going to Lucknow? Ten years back, this was the situation. So you're fighting internally and you're fighting externally also. But definitely, uh, government will not uh, lag behind in bringing technology and stories. Uh, I, 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 I would request everybody to go to Patna Museum. And now in India, uh, you talk about some museum in London, or uh, we keep on talki uh, talking about some fancy uh, places abroad. But I would recommend everybody to, the, uh, to go to Patna Museum, which is a government enterprise. And if you look at the children's section, it is hit, super hit. Um, and uh, actually mothers fighting with the kids to drag them out. And there are no smartphones, there are no QR codes, there are no technological guides. But kids are being there. And you ha really have to struggle to take them out. So I hope for a better situation uh, in future. I yeah. I
feel like a playground there, <coughs> nothing to buy at the mall. But you learn how uh, electricity is generated with the turbines and all the different things. And all of them have <coughs> interactive with, uh, connection with that. So it's terrific to watch. You know? So we have to be very careful, I'm saying, of technologies and right. where and when. And I think just to going back to the earlier point as well, I think what the point she, uh, you know, Malvika is making as well as Kruti is that um, there is a ready audience looking for more. There are professionals who uh, have trained, who are passionate about the sector. And I think what we want to do is collaborate with the museums, government museums, and the government does own, you know, over 800 museums in India. So it'd be great if we could have that collaboration and the government being more open to uh, both audiences that are ready and professionals who want to work in the space. Any more questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, my uh, comment was, you know, that since museums are regarded as a repository of historic objects, it's closely connected to trends in historiography, where history is no longer the history of kings and queens, but of the common people. You have subaltern histories of peasants, workers, soldiers, and so forth. And museums are increasingly reflecting that. So from that new perspective of the role of government, I think Tejas' uh, uh, insights which he has given us are very important. And if we are to talk of how government can help, you mentioned one about forts that you have this huge real estate which is lying vacant and unused and it can be fruitfully used as museum space which is directly connected to the fort itself. Now we had problems, I, I, I am still a trustee of the Maritime Heritage Foundation which was set up with the Indian Navy with sitting at uh, admiral, serving admirals as trustees and we had huge problems in the archaeological survey of just having a statue put of uh, Angre. He said, no, 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 you know, this is the Alibak Fort, this is under our, our province, even though you are the Navy, we still can't allow it. So the major, you know, territorial issues of jurisdiction and how you interact, so if, if there are some ways that that, that that could be overcome, even for a naval organization. Uh, secondly, how can these forts be uh, utilized as museums uh, spaces? Furthermore, you have other areas where government is already the owner or the custodian. Look at the Maharashtra State Archives. They're just a few buildings away in Elphinstone College. It's one of the richest archives in the country. I work there myself. All these archives are just existing in closed silos. There's no interaction with the public. Uh, an, uh, an archive person has no conception of relating to the public. That's a tragedy. They think it's scholars do not be allowed to have access unless you get a letter from uh, a university uh, administration. Now that has to change. And uh, thirdly is this whole area of oral history, you know, that look at the role that government can play. Uh, look at the uh, pensioners who have such fantastic stories to tell. We are freedom fighters who are all dying out. When you are giving them a pension, you have their addresses on record, you have some idea of what activity they participated in for which they are getting a pension. It doesn't require much to send a trained team of oral historians to record you know, their testimonies before they die. Similarly for old soldiers who fought in India's wars. And uh, you know, so many others, I mean the big problem, I, I, I'm, I'm a, uh, you know, uh, I've trained in history and the big problem we have is we don't have records of ordinary people. The records are all government records. But we can supplement that with these oral histories where government using its pension records can uh, fulfill an enormous uh, uh, you know, lacuna. So I would like your, uh, you know, your ideas on this and even our other panelists. Sure, thank you. Thank you for bringing in statues in the discussion. <laughs> because I was son of a sculptor, but I would not vouch for Angari or any statue inside a protected monument. One has to understand uh, uh, and respect ethics of uh, certain areas and, of course, uh, laws of the land. Uh, I mean, it's an experience to serve in an uh, organization like Archaeological Survey of India where you get to see spaces and public from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. 
uh, I can name you at least a dozen of projects, including putting a 22 feet statue of the Raja Rajeshwar Chola inside Bhadeshwar Temple. So, if you make one exception in Kulava Fort, it will be coated currently white and heritage spaces will be compromised and they will not be uh, in original shape as they were at the time of Angliya's. Even uh, if he turns up, he would say, make, spend this money on making our navy better rather than putting up my statue. We do respect uh, our heroes and we need to have the statues to commemorate their memories. But uh, we can uh, have a better selection of spaces. Uh, well, that's my personal take uh, on this. Yeah, it's not. Uh, and of course, uh, I think in future uh, we would be uh, better uh, in terms of dealing with public. Uh, right now, many a times it's it's hard to allocate staff uh, just dedicated for the visitors. Uh, you have uh, certain, you are always uh, manpower starved, and you have n number of jobs to perform. So there are hardly any people who are working on public relationship. Uh, but I think the future is better with more digitalization, with more access uh, through web. Uh, right now, concern is to preserve the original document. So uh, people might be skeptical uh, who are in charge to give somebody who is non-trained in handling those documents. There is always a danger. At, uh, we had a wonderful library at uh, Aun Museum in Satara district and it was all collection of that Maharaja and it was uh, accessed, uh, uh, it had open access to the public and now look at it, half of the pages are gone. So there is always a danger uh, in giving open access to public. So that's why it is restricted to the community which is trained to handle documents. But if we digitalize, I think even uh, people who are in charge like me, they, they will have this comfort of uh, preserving the original document and people can access through um, uh, web. Um, any questions for the alternative museum spaces? I think we have one question there. Sorry, he put up his hand first and then we'll open up the mics. Good evening. Uh, it's a thought, a suggestion. Uh, how about a museum for the historical collection of architecture in our country? It would have to be in the form of a huge website with great photographs and great write-ups. But the variety of architecture that we have is as much as the cultural variety that we bring to our own country. Even walking along VT to Profit Market, round Xavier's College and back to VT, you will see buildings which are 100 to 200 years old. And I see people walking past it without even looking at it. Children are missing the buildings in which their schools are housed, 100 and 150 years old. And I think we need to educate the boys, the children of the future, as to what diversity of architecture we do have from temples to churches to mosques to buildings everywhere, north to south, east to west. Thank you. Give yeah. it a thought. Thank you. Sure. You may have to shout. <laughs> The alternative spaces or alternative places of display. I have two suggestions. One thing is that the Prince of Wales Museum had already started a practice of allowing uh, private collectors to display their collection. Right. Uh, and they would, even their curatorial department will help in curating as well as preserving the document. I, had, I was one of the first to do that when I did the Shami Kapoor exhibition at the Prince of Wales Museum. So that is one way of do, uh, doing pe for people who do not have the money to uh, to make an exhibit or to make a museum, at least they can display. Second thing, I'm going to make a very revolutionary suggestion. How many people are aware that within about a kilometer from Bombay, there is an island which is lying vacant? 
when I applied for permission to B, uh, BPT, they said in last 100 years nobody has asked for this permission. And that is the cross island. That is the cross island which is across the ferry wharf. It is supposed to be a government property. There is a board that it is government property. Even the, the boat wala with whom I went there, he said I have been carrying people to Uran and um, Elephanta and all that, but never had a chance to step on this. So with proper permission I went there, that island is lying vacant. It's of the size of almost an oval maidan. So that island, I went there, uh, there was no place to even land. So the boat wala says you'll have to jump into the sea, it about six, six feet or five feet, and then cross. But then we found that there was a little portion of the wall which we climbed upon and went on the island. There are at least 10 to 12 cannon guns which are lying there. There is a, there is a dilapidated structure, I don't know for what it is, and there are some wet type of structures, so there. So that land can easily be used as an alternate museum. I would say even the Shivaji statue can be put there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Any, yeah, sure, yes. I'd like to ask Choti a question. Um, you, uh, you were talking about how you enter communities for MU projects. Uh, you said we go to the places where we have access to. Uh, I really like to know more about how you find access to some communities, which communities you choose, because for me, uh, as someone working with a participatory approach, it's always a question, how should we enter the community, not to be an outcomer coming from nowhere and just making some harm to the community. Community. And when should we leave? How should we leave? How should we make friends so that they don't feel that we are some outsiders coming from nowhere as strangers? That's my question I'd like to know more about. And I have the same question for, <laughs> for Kruti as well. Um, we're, we're, in all honesty, we're riding on the work done by someone else already who's placed within the community who has uh, gone from, uh, who has not pro possibly uh, been part of the community but have made themselves part of the community by, uh, by uh, diff and we know a little histories of how they have made, to answer your question, how they have made efforts to become part of the community. Uh, which uh, there have been uh, community history projects, community history exhibitions in museums, games, community games that people have played, uh, particularly the space that we did it in Delhi with, uh, which is an alternative theater performing arts space uh, that started in Shadi Khampur. Shadi Khampur, like I said, is a migrant community. Uh, and the people who went and because they got, that's where they found the space to build their theater space, they had to spend many years uh, in trying to become one with, their, win, one with the community and they're still working on it. And it's a critical thing because, uh, I, because I wanted to know from Kruti the same thing. How did you, uh, because we had the advantage of knowing the people who were working there who've already put in that effort, uh, who did a lot of, children are a great way. <laughs> Theater is a great way. Uh, uh, keeping doors open for th for things that the community relate with, because very often with arts uh, with arts projects it becomes so niche so fast uh, that uh, one has to be very wary of that constantly. Uh, there are a number of art spaces in and around uh, Delhi that the community around has no clue what goes on inside those closed doors. And we are only going into spaces where the doors are open, where the, the, ones, the people who run the space have made concerted efforts uh, by doing theater workshops, by uh, documenting and exhibiting and the history of the people who have come there. Um, and uh, a lot of public exhibitions, a lot of public uh, performances, public interactive things. And uh, how did the Dharavi project, how did you make inroads into the community? Because from, uh, from, my exp from our little experience with Moo in the community, that the kind of, the kind of stories that came and the kind of uh, footfalls that we had 
would not have happened uh, if if there wasn't inherent trust and that uh, we couldn't have built it in 10 days it it's taken them 10 years um so i think it does help to have an insider person so you you know find somebody who will introduce you so whether it's part of another organization who is working in that space or that you know a lot of times in because with dharavi there was a lot of walking in like different areas and kind of re-getting like kind of you know doing this exercise over and over again because it wasn't this one community as a large dharavi it was all these various sort of silos within that um we found actually that the people were super open if you were really honest so if you didn't promise you know saying oh we are going to give you all this business or you know we want you to make this because you will get this big order and all of that if you kind of told them your intention up front uh, a lot of people said no but there will be like this one person who says yes who will open their doors and welcome you in so it was a lot of walking around literally that it's like oh i'm here this is my project you know uh, do you have time to listen and if you find actually like those one or two people who are willing to listen they become again portals to open up to the rest saying okay you know yeah now i have a friend and i can take you there or oh, this is what you need i'll do this and a lot of the times it does go wrong and you have to kind of be like open to that you have to allow time for that you know that it, it this whole process happened as i said like you know over a few months before even a two day exhibition could happen because a lot of times people promised me things which didn't happen you know and that sort of stuff but i think to really be very clear about your intent so i would literally kind of you know very very emphatically say that look this is how long my project is i'm not here to you know help this larger situation for over a few years or whatever that i'm talking to you as a designer as an artist who's come here to do this right and that is a really kind of i think sensitive way to then prepare them for your exit and not leave them saying oh you know this is not what we expected um, yeah <laughs> on that note <laughs> well uh, to sum up uh, dialogue with community with lot of trust with lot of uh, truth uh, a true approach is really important and luckily uh, we do function a bit different from the revenue officials who are there to impose upon something uh, we do excavate lot of sites so it's basically working with communities we do spend lot of time it is not matter of going there for a day and coming back with a data so we work together for months and months and uh, that is how you build trust Okay so thank you all and thank you all for coming and for asking questions please go out support um you know all kinds of museum spaces and demand better museums and demand saving of heritage but thank you all for coming thank you thank you all thank you to our panel for this very exciting discussion i wish we had more time for more questions i mean uh, especially thank you to dr garge for inviting avid in to collaborate I, i i mean i honestly think that the whole public private partnership is one really tangible way to take this forward it's, it's a little unfair expecting the government to do everything uh, you know there are such amazing case studies happening at the moment i don't know if anyone knows is aditya arya's camera museum in in gurgaon i was fortunate enough it's an old badminton court that the government and gave him and he has to raise the funds part of the funds for the museum which he's doing and through public and through donations and i think it's a fantastic model you have museums opening in the red fort which is another example of public private partnership asi is uh, you know contracting private uh, arts institutions to take this forward so i think there's a lot of scope my team told me they want the island versus the fort so uh, that's our request but thank you for being here thank you for the wonderful panel um at the next uh, discussion in this series is illustration and the city it's going to happen on june 20th 
at this wonderful NGMA. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to our partners, the NGMA, uh, Dr. Rupa Bhattara, I mean, Mrs. Rupa Bhattara and Shruti for, um, you know, always giving us support to do these um, little alternate programs out here. Um, thank you. Have a good night. And we have uh, many wonderful programs at AVID. Uh, we seem to have many every week. Uh, we have a foot portrait photography workshop happening tomorrow in case any uh, photobug wants to join that. Uh, and then we have, we are starting our third edition of our Beyond Contemporary Art series next week on the 2nd, and that will be at the Art Musings Gallery. Thank you very much. Good night.